for joining us, Sean and Kate. Thank you guys. We're very honored to have you. We've got a few questions that came in on the internet, but first I wanna hear Kate, first date and how did he propose? <laughs> first date, we were only 16 years old. So we, Sean took me to a nice restaurant. What was a nice restaurant at no, 16? It, it was a nice restaurant, like downtown in, in a city. And I had only ever gone to like Olive Garden as being the nicest restaurant. So I ordered a salad and it, I think it was probably like arugula or something. And I was like, I think I'm eating like leaves. Like it was the <laughs> grossest thing I'd ever eaten in my life. And I was just like trying to pick around. I didn't know what to do. And oh my goodness, this is so funny. Yeah, we've grown up together. And how did and, he propose? Oh, how did he propose? He surprised me and he, um, he was in college at the time, came home and told me, please pray for me. I'm having the biggest exam of my life because it was exams. And I was like, okay. So I'm like praying for him for the biggest exam. And then he shows up to this park that meant a lot. And I was the biggest exam of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he passed it. Yes. Yes. I passed. Praise God. <laughs> Show a quick uh, wedding photo. This will be fun. There we go. The baby. How old were you guys? When you got I married? was 20 and he was 22. Yeah. And how many years married now? Yeah, you see those frosted tips. Those are fire. That was in back then. Come on, everybody. That's like a late 90s worship leader standard oh, yeah. kit. In sync vibes, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, we just celebrated 18 years. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Well, they sent in some questions. Why don't we throw them up and you can ask them, best friend. Is premarital counseling worth it? <laughs> I think it's, ne it's a necessity, absolutely, but from somebody that you trust and, and a good, uh, we failed premarital counseling. Explain that. We, we failed really miserably. <laughs> it was a it's thing. It's actually a funny story. We, we went to premarital counseling and we did one of those bubble tests. And well, I was on staff at a church yes. and they mandated us to do this certain Premarital with that counseling. Person. And so, in, yeah. yeah. And so we failed it. And he told us. What that do you we mean you failed it? I don't know. Apparently, from the test, he was going to abuse me and I was going to hide in closets. <laughs> from the bubbles. From the bubbles? From the bubbles. He filled out a personality test. Yes. And the guy was like, no, He's it's like, not no. going to happen. And he called me up until our wedding, begging me not to marry this evil human. <laughs> so I, I highly recommend it from somebody, like from a church like this. <laughs> like, do this for me. But the moral story is don't just go on the line and, online and start filling yes. out bubbles. Yes, 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 yeah. totally. And, and it's unfortunate because we could have gotten a lot from premarital counseling that would have helped us tremendously since we got married as kids. Um, so I highly recommend it to every single person I know that's getting married. Not the bubble test. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I think, you know, like mentorship, people that, and I don't know, I mean, I think it's good churches can provide that, but there's also a lot of amazing older couples out yes. there that are just seasoned, they have incredible marriages. And my suggestion would, and going along with your sermon, find somebody whose marriage you want yours to look like. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and be like, yeah, those are the people, right? And, and learn from them and have them be a part of your process. That's How funny do you think it is when young people write marriage books? Oh, <laughs> yes. It'd be like me writing a parenting book when I'm like in the thick of it. It's just. Yeah. Because <laughs> a lot a of the books, yet. it's like influencers, they're like 23 year old yes. couple, they're like, we wrote this How to Have a Great Marriage on Our Honeymoon book. I'm sure it'll <laughs> transform your life. It's so yeah, true. I mean, I think we 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 have lost this generation. We've lost the, um, the like we've lost the reverence for old gray haired people to give us wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the people we need to learn from on raising kids, on on parenting, on marriage. And so, you know, like that's why I believe that you know the Bible says that you know that this. This whole end time move, I believe, is going to be, you know, the older people with their wisdom, the young people with their zeal. We need both. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to this topic of marriage, like, you know, and Kate and I, are, we're always trying to seek out uh, the guidance, especially with four kids, um, of people that have done it well. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just encourage those of you guys out there, you younger couples, to do the same. I know. How about the next one? How do I help my wife overcome sexual trauma from her past? 
Do you want me to take this one? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say um, this is a massive and major generational issue. Yes. And um, it leads to a lot of <laughs> confusion. And um, I just want to publicly honor my wife, Grace. We were married for many years and didn't know that this was part of your story. And then, um, and you hadn't really connected the dots. And then we did. And ever since then, you've been very brave uh, to talk about some things that happened before we met. And I think it's encouraged a lot of people yeah. uh, to get help for what they, you know, need to heal from. So thank you. And yeah, I'll let you answer this one. Sweetie. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it in our first marriage book, uh, Real Marriage. And um, I was shocked how many women came up to me just in tears saying thank you for being honest about this because nobody's willing to talk about it, especially in the church. Um, there's a lot of shame around any kind of abuse. But yeah, for us, um, it was about 12 years into our marriage um, when I discovered he was just asking me questions and I just discovered um, that I had actually been a victim of uh, sexual trauma. And... Um, and it was just a really rocky path for us to figure out how to get help because yeah. um, it just wasn't right in front of us. And so um, I went to a really horrifying place for a week to try and work through it, and I would never recommend it to anyone. But and, but God is so good. He used it anyway okay. and um, just started the process. The first thing is just to start the process, and it's a very hard process of healing. But God is so good and, and patient and Mark came alongside me, so we worked it through together. Even though it was something I went through, we were married and we're one. And so it was super important for him to respond to me well and patiently and graciously and and just sometimes, and not try and fix it because there's no way for him to fix me in that situation. It's him um, coming around me and walking through with me so that God, the Holy Spirit, can fix me and heal me, really. Um, and I was very broken. So I would just encourage you as a husband, husband since it's a husband asking this um start by really getting some good help only christian counseling will help because only jesus and can help with the soul level of things and so there's a lot of really bad counselors unfortunately there's yeah. unfortunately bad christian counselors that are woke and so um do research and make sure this person believes in the bible and lives it and even has a good marriage um but I would recommend you going to a woman, if you're a woman that has that in your past, and someone that's trauma-informed, means they know how to work with that specifically, and they'll walk you through the process. And again, it's not gonna be easy, but I promise you on the other side, it's amazing, and the freedom that you will know, um, it's there's nothing like it. And so it's just, it's a process. And some people, it takes longer than others. Um, God was really gracious with me and helped me work it through really, um, fairly quickly, and um, Mark was really good at just holding my hand, holding me in my tears, not having any answers, but just praying for me and encouraging me and and lifting me up as a person and saying that it's you don't have to stay a victim of this, um, and we're going to get through this. And so really encourage her and um, give her lots of compliments and um, pray over her, wash her in the word, not in a judgmental way, um, and, and really seek that help. Be willing to pay for good help. That's good. Anything you guys want to add? I would just say, I mean, as we've traveled America from city to city, you know, um, hundreds of cities since, since 2020, you know, I, I really believe this is the most assaulted, mm -hmm. molested, abused generation that's ever existed mm -hmm. and the perversion and the trauma and I mean our altar calls are filled with Gen Zers that want to get free mm -hmm. and it all comes back to trauma you know that they've endured and so I would say this just along with what you're saying like um, you know don't buy into the to the cultural lie that this is meant to be something to be managed right this is something you can't get free from. And we see God do it. And, and it does take work and help and people, but don't buy into the cultural thing that this is something you're just going to have to live with. We've seen God set people radically free 100%. from a lot, of, a lot of horrendous things like what the enemy meant for evil, God is turning it around in a generation. And I believe God's raising up a purity movement that's going to smash the head of the devil. Yeah. 
in this nation. Anything you'd add, Ken? No, I think this is... On the Real Faith page, too, in the Real Women section, there is a whole list of resources, and there is books on this for um, sexual trauma, if you want to look at those as well. And I would just add one more of a kind of a theological Bible nerd, but um, in Christianity, we talk a lot about that Jesus will forgive your sin, which is true. But the question is, what if you weren't the one that sinned, but you were sinned against? And Jesus not only forgives your sin, he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And so um, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for your sin and your shame. And it said he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And so there's this, this old school kind of theological <coughs> doctrine called expiation. And that is that Jesus not only forgives you, he makes you clean. Yeah. And a lot of people, they feel like, well, Jesus has forgiven me, but I'm still dirty. And it's like, no, Jesus has forgiven you and he's made you clean. And so when people go to worship God in the Old Testament, at the base of the mountain, they would wash, showing that that's what Jesus was coming to do. And then they would wear white and they would sing the Psalms of Ascent as they headed up to the presence of God. And then we see in Revelation, when Jesus returns, his bride, the church, is wearing white. And so white in the Bible is the color of expiation. And it's showing, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what they've done, what he's done is made you clean and pure. And I think without that, you can feel like you're forgiven, but you're damaged. Mm -hmm. And we've got a whole generation, as you indicated, that's basically saying, my trauma is now my identity. Right rather than my healer and my deliverer and my savior is the source of my identity. And so, you know, Jesus, that's why a wife, I'll close this, that's why on a wedding day, a wife wears white, especially if she belongs to Jesus, because that's how he sees her. And then as the husband, even if your wife has been through trauma, you've got to get Jesus' eyes and you've got to see her as he sees her and he, as he declares her um, cleansed, you know, not just from what she's done, but also what's been done to her. Yeah. And uh, for a man, it just rises up this vengeance because how could someone do this to the most important person I've ever met? And so as a man, we've got to see expiation for her, and then we've got to deal with bitterness against the offender. And as a husband, it's very difficult because to think that someone could do that to the person that you would die for yeah. is just a horrifying thing. So the man not only needs to comfort his wife, he's got to deal with his own anger and vengeance and bitterness once he hears what was done to his girl. Yeah, and the biggest lie that I believed was that it didn't affect me, and that's why I didn't think it was trauma. And I also thought that I deserved it. Um, that's what he had convinced me of. And so if that's you in this room and your husband's trying to get you help, listen, he wants to care for you in this and be willing to walk through that healing process because the lies are... They can go through your head and unfortunately can try and convince you to not get help. Thank you, babe. How about next one? What do you suggest when one spouse wants to have a child and the other does not? That's a good question for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we've had a journey with this in different yeah. times. Even before we had started a family, I was ready. I mean, I was born to be a mother. I would dreamt of it when I was a little girl and I was so excited when we got married and I was ready to have babies and he's like I'm not ready it's not time um and I had to like submit to time that. has not come no. <laughs> and I remember just like giving it to the Lord and submitting and and really choosing to um come under him in our marriage and and as a family and trust him and trust his relationship with the Lord and knowing that um it, and that was really actually a beautiful thing that we could learn together in that season. But then also, when, when after our third baby, he was done. He's like, that's crazy. We're done. <laughs> we were, it was wild. But I knew so much that I was not done. I knew that there was somebody. And so I He's never been done. <laughs> yeah. I remember we went out to lunch and I just was like, listen, babe, like I support you and your dreams and your calling. And this is my dream and my calling. And I need you to support me. And he's like, okay. <laughs> he's like, just promise me we don't have to talk about it right now. Cause we had just had our third. I'm like, we don't have to talk about it right now. And now our fourth is, what do we call him? The grand finale. He is <laughs> like something else. 
<laughs> He's a lot. Zion the lion. Yeah. Is what we call him. So anyways, it's funny. I'm like, I heard you screaming my it, name it, from it, heaven. It, it, it's fascinating to me, like, like what women endure. And, <laughs> and then they want to do it again. I know. Again. Yeah. And again. Yeah. It's like not that long after, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my encouragement, like, and, and, and she's just, I mean, I, I just, I love what an amazing mom she is and how she just, you know, that's her, her dream is to be, and she is the most incredible mom. Um, but there's a lot of what's fascinating. I was talking to Pastor Mark about this. There's a lot of women in today's culture, their husbands want to have children and they don't want to have them. Do you guys see that much? That's just wild. <laughs> but I get that. Did you want to be a dad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, I was like, yeah. I really, I've always yeah. wanted to be a dad. Yeah. But I can't imagine if you're a man and you get married and your wife is like, no, that's got to be totally disorienting. Yeah. Yeah. And it should be something you talk about before you get married, just right. as yes. a pro tip. Yeah. It's a good pro tip. Yeah. And, and, and also like... The, you know, the, the, I think the biggest lie that young couples um, buy into is we're not ready. Oh, you're, you ain't never ready. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to have enough money. Yeah. You're never going to be in the right position. It's yeah. never going to happen. In yeah. fact, I would like to, to say this, provision comes with the children. Yes. It's it really does. Like, and I, 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 we know, I, Kate and I, we always laugh about this because we live in Orange County and it's like, it, the air costs money <laughs> like to breathe. And every family that we know that has like a zillion kids, we're like, I don't know. They never run out of money or yeah. anything. Yeah. Sprinter vans and they just have stuff everywhere and all their kids have practices <laughs> yeah. and different things. And it's just like somehow there's a grace that comes with every single child. And I believe it's supernatural. It is. You know, and I believe that part of the lie we've bought into it in cultures that kids are a liability yeah. and they're difficult. No, no, no. Kids are a blessing and they're an abundance yes. and they bring, they bring nothing but blessing on our lives, yes. nothing but favor on our lives, yes. nothing but joy to our lives. So resist that lie from culture. It's BS. It's from the devil. Okay. Children are not. They are a blessing. They are a blessing. They are a blessing. And and eventually they give you grandchildren. <laughs> That's true. I know, you're living in the best yeah, part. we are. You're, you're in another state. Yeah, you were just up in our office with a couple of grandkids, and it's awesome. Yeah. It is a loud, expensive, wonderful chaos. Welcome to children. <laughs> and, uh, and to me, um, if you're going to live your whole life and you don't want to live it for someone else, I don't know how you can become like Jesus. Right. Yeah. What would you add, babe? Yeah, if, I mean, we're born selfish. If you want to keep being selfish, don't have kids because they will teach you how to not be selfish. Um, marriage teaches you how to not be selfish, and then kids teach you a whole other level of not being selfish. And they are a lot of work, but it teaches you to work hard, and the blessing that they are is incredible. There's nothing like it. And so, and it makes you work together as a couple in different ways, too. So, it, it makes you grow up. It makes you become more responsible. It makes you not self not be selfish. Um, I always say that's why God gave me five, because he had a lot of work to do in me. And so it's just, <laughs> it's sad when people don't want that, because women are built to be nurturers, whether it's their own kids or if they can't have kids, a spiritual mom to other kids or a teacher. They're built to invest in kids. And so you're literally denying part of the role that God has created you to do, and it just makes me sad um, when girls are deceived um, and say they don't want kids because it really is, um, they're missing out. Yeah. I'll add one more, we'll do one more question. So the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, and sometimes people don't wanna have kids because of the kind of childhood that they had. That's Their parents true. got divorced, there was right. bitterness, there was brokenness, there was trauma, and they're, they're like, I wanna have kids, but you know, I don't want them to go through what I went through. Yeah. Or if you look at the world in which we live, right. you're like, it looks like we're doing the purge, right. you know, and I don't know if I want to have kids. Um, but then it's getting beyond the fear because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And it really, sometimes the greatest act of faith is getting married and having kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, I trust that God is going to show up because if he doesn't, this isn't going to work. Yeah. So let's do one more. Um, 
Date nights are always my idea. How can I get my hubby to take initiative once in a while? Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to this. Um, you know, I was talking to someone trying to get advice years ago about Sean and my in our marriage, and I was I was waiting for him to become me, truly. <laughs> you know, like. I want, I, I don't want to tell him what I want or need. I want him to do what I want and need on his own because that will make me feel known and understood and loved. And she just looked at me and was like, what? You didn't marry yourself. I mean, I didn't say it that clear. That would have been a lot of self-awareness. At the time, I was like, he, I was saying that exact thing. And she's like, tell him, like, he married you because he loves you. Like, tell him your needs and your desires and your heart and let him rise up to that challenge. And my goodness, are things a whole lot smoother when I look at him and I'm like, hey, I would really love to go on a date this month or this week or whatever. And he's like, let's do it. That is so much better than me going, I wish that he would take me on a date this week. And I am so offended that he's out there playing basketball with my kids instead of taking me on a date, you know? And I just think, and it's funny because I hear women talking like that, some of my friends. Like they're waiting, they're like waiting to set up their spouse, their husband to disappoint them. And how many times I've done that? I just like set you up to disappoint me so I could be right that I was going to be disappointed. And so I would encourage anybody and everybody, ask for the God, things of your men heart. Men need help, okay? Yes. <laughs> it's this, not this, bad. Listen, listen yes. this is not difficult, yes, okay? it's just... <laughs> Women, like, yes. we need help. Yes. Just tell us what do you need, okay? Yes. What do you need? It's true. He's what too... do you need? Yes. He's... We'll do it, okay? Yes. Tell us. And guess what? He <laughs> rises to the occasion. Like, we just had this. Last yeah. week, I texted him, like, I got reservations. We're going on a date. And it was so much fun. And, and if you don't know where to take her, you know a good trick? This is a great trick just for the men out there. This comic relief moment. Um, just be like, guess where? I'm taking you somewhere. Guess where it is. The first place she guesses <laughs> is where you should go. <laughs> Bro, isn't that clutch? Yeah. yeah. That's clutch. That was strong. Yeah. That's all we need, bro. We just close right there. That's the best advice. No, that is literally the best advice. <laughs> or I saw on Instagram funny thing where guys like, you get to choose where do you want to go? Stay home and have dinner or go to an exclusive club and have dinner? Exclusive members only. And she's like, oh, okay, wow. And they're eating at Costco. <laughs> <laughs> Members only. <laughs> Members only. Yeah. Exclusive. Free refills. Free refills. $1.50. Actually, the, the drink comes free with a hot dog. <laughs> anyway, but I have learned that time and time again in my marriage to not be offended for, you know, to ask for what I need and not be offended that he wasn't me. <laughs> like, that's my art. Yeah, resentment is destruction in marriage for sure. Um, and I would just recommend in any conversation, whether it's around dates or anything that you're desiring but not, but becoming embittered <laughs> about, um, try a positive approach instead of like, you never take me on dates. Try going to him and saying, I would really love to go on a date. What do you think about that? Just offer a suggestion. Don't get bitter <coughs> inside and then get negative and, and negging. Um, because that you, you really will never get the response you're hoping for. And so try and encourage, hey, I'd love to get time with you. What do you think about setting a regular date night? What does that look like? Just a suggestion, you know? But do it from a, I would love to get time with you, or I would love to spend this with you, or because that's an encouragement. That's a respect of them, and it's encouragement for your relationship. So take a positive approach. Cool. I think we'll just leave it there. I really liked yours. That was my favorite one. That was really good. Got tricks for days. Yeah, any, any, any woman who thinks eventually my man is going to think like me, yes. she's nope. just decades of disappointment. I mean, just decades. Really? We're very simple. Yeah. You're like, what are you thinking? You don't want to know. You know? <laughs> so, so. All right, we'll leave it with that. And I think we're going to give away a gift to the winner of the giveaway. Thank you guys for joining us. Hope you had fun. Can you thank... Sean and Kate for joining us. Amen. Yeah, thank you guys so much. We'd love to pray over Sean and Kate in just a second, but first we have a giveaway. Uh, Ashley? Okay, we have this 
Wonderful book. 10 out of 10 would recommend if you have not purchased it. I believe it's for sale in the lobby, written by my wonderful parents. Real romance. Um, along with a gift card to a great restaurant here in the Valley to go on a nice, fancy date. Chili's. So, Chili's. Chili's. Yeah, Sean picked the gift card. <laughs> All right. So the winner is Sophia Kelly. Are you here? Give it up for Sophia Kelly. Where are you? There she Where's is. Sophia? Yay! There she Come is. on down. And while we're doing that, just so you guys know, Sean's latest book, there is a limited supply in the lobby, and he should not head home with any of them. You guys should rush the lobby and fight over the last books. Make sure you do that. And then this week, there is no real men or real women, because real men and real women go on dates on Valentine's Day. They don't go to church. Amen. Um, and with that, Pastor Mark, do you want to pray for Sean and his ministry? So you're going to Vegas tomorrow. Are you both going? Oh, so you're both going to Vegas uh, to lead worship and prayer headed into the Super Bowl for all the people who were there uh, to hear about Jesus. So thank you for doing that. And uh, maybe you guys join me. We just pray for them. Father, we pray uh, for our friends and we pray God for their big day tomorrow as God the the massive sporting event that is the Super Bowl is happening and it's happening in Sin City. And we would ask in Jesus' name that for many, it would be Savior City. We ask yeah. for those who went there to yes. drink and party and carouse and celebrate, but maybe they'd find healing and forgiveness yeah. and deliverance and hope. <clears throat> and so Lord, uh, we just ask for an anointing on our friends as they go tomorrow and on their ministry. We pray for those who will be walking and marching and worshiping and singing and praying with them and pray God that uh, those who are believers would be encouraged and those who don't know the Lord Jesus would consider him and come to meet him. Thank you for their sacrifice to travel the country, to lead worship at our state capitals, uh, to take the head on collisions as they come with culture. And God, thank you as he is a bit of a fire starter going from city to city to ignite passion for Jesus and to uh, involve the Holy Spirit in awakening souls. God, thank you for his beautiful wife. Thank you for their beautiful children. Thank you for their dear family. Pray for protection over them, provision uh, surrounding them and your presence to lead them in Jesus name. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for joining us. <coughs> All right, you guys. Is this one? Nope. Whoa. Dude. All right, do that one. Is this going to work? It's too much testosterone, Sean. It, it messes up the frequency. I apologize. Happens all the time. So, could you guys thank uh, Sean and Kate for joining us? Thank you guys for coming out. And uh, you left your beautiful kids, and you've got a wonderful family. We love you guys. You've been here many times. We appreciate you. Beautiful family. And I wanted to show a photo and then ask a question, and I want you to answer, okay? So show the photo, please. This was your wedding photo. Are you ready? Ah. Uh, okay, here's the first question. The last time you had a haircut. <laughs> I was going to ask. Thank you. So tell us the story. How did you guys meet? Just background on your relationship. We met in youth group, worship leader over here. And actually, it's funny. We were friends. And I, I was so naive. I had no idea that he was, like, pursuing me because I was, like, you know, 16 years old. And we were friends. And he would start showing up my games, my volleyball games. And then all of a sudden, one day at a volleyball game, my coach was like, Kate, we need to have you come over here. Um, you need to tell your boyfriend he's never allowed to come here. I'm like, boyfriend? He got kicked off because he was driving the, the go-karts around the, the, pro the golf carts around the property of the private school I was playing at. So that's how we started our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> the rebel over here. But yeah, we started dating at 16. And wow, we have grown up together. That is the perfect way to say it. How old were you guys when you got married? 20. It was, I mean... You yeah. can tell we're babies. You were 20, you were 22? Yeah, 22. Yeah. And how long have you guys been married for now? 18, coming up on 18 years. No, coming up on yeah. 19. 19. <laughs> well, we just celebrated 18. We just celebrated 18, so. That's really funny to tell people when we're out to dinner, our waiters. They're like, so what are you doing celebrating our anniversary? Like, oh, yeah, how long? We're like, 18 years. And they're like... What? Because <laughs> people get married at like 40 now. Yeah. yeah. Which is great. And marriage is... Anything. So tell us about the kids real quick, the family. Well, I'm sorry. Tell us about the kids, the family real quick. We have four kids. 
uh, we have one girl who's 13, Katura, and then three boys that just, it's rowdy. It's wild. It's fun. Yeah. I grew up with three sisters. I was the only boy. She grew up with three sisters, all girls. So the Lord is, 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 is bringing back the testosterone yeah. in our lineage, yeah. and uh, and it's a great thing. Yeah, I'm living out his childhood dreams of just having like boys everywhere, that which is great. It's we're never bored. It's great. Yeah. You guys willing to answer some questions we took from the internet? Let's do it. I don't know what they're going to be. They're going to be good or bad, but they'll be up in a minute. So, Grace, do you want to read them and ask the first one? Sure. Should you text or be friends with people of the opposite sex if you're married? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> like, um, just always be above approach, right? Reproach. Reproach. Reproach, Reproach yes. I, I know that when we first got married and we were in ministry and we had interns and different people and he'd be, like, texting them just to get things done or whatever. And I'm like, you can't do that. Like, we, we were trying to figure out boundaries, and he was so confused. He's like, but she's a really great person. She's really nice. She loves the Lord. I'm like, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, exactly. I'm not worried about you with like weirdos. <laughs> like, that's not a worry. So, we definitely set yeah. up some some big boundaries. It's a great boundary to have. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. So, what do you guys? I mean, you're on social media a lot. You tour a lot. You're on the like. How many times a year? Like, are you on the road doing worship events at state capitals, or yeah. I mean, how much are you guys just? Out and about. Yeah, I mean, it's always been a big, big part of our life and a big part of our ministry is, is going. And whether it's, you know, nations or the Middle East or around the world or, or here domestically. And the seasons of her coming or the kids coming have kind of fluctuated. Of course, during COVID, when everything was shut down, we just rolled as a family, you know, everywhere. And so we still do that to some degree. But yeah, there is a lot of times where we're separated and times where they're where part of them are with me or some of them are with me or none of them are with me so so what do you guys do like wise counsel just here's some good habits just to maintain healthy balance. yeah i i really love um and just interjecting my own personal uh, advice in this like there's a book called the leadership secrets of billy graham and one of the things that people always were um uh, you know, they, they thought Billy Graham was so religious because he would never get in an elevator alone with a woman. He would never, he would go into a hotel room, he would make them take the TV out of his hotel room before he got in there. He did all these things that people thought in his day were very religious and over the top, but yet he came out of it with no scandal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's his legacy as opposed to, I could mention the names <laughs> in his day. And so I, I just think that's a very great way. I mean, it, uh, you know, I, I travel a lot with my team. There's a guy that I, I, we stay in a hotel room together. He unfortunately snores a lot. <laughs> um, but I mean, we always know where each other are. We're always keeping tabs on each other. And we just, we don't play games with that kind of stuff. Yeah, even so, with social media, like yeah. having people in your life have access to your social media. Yeah. So do you think your spouse should have access to your social media or somebody on your team? Yes, I do. Because it's just accountability. Yeah. You know, it's safety. I think, have you guys ever seen It's not seen because them? you're scared. It's not out of fear. Have you guys ever seen those videos of like where the guy walks up on the street, hey, let me see your wife's phone. Let me see your husband's oh, yeah. phone. Yeah. And they scroll <laughs> through it. Like, have you seen those? No. I don't know. Unbelievable. People and, get all like. And, and, and yeah, the spouses get all, what are you going to look at? And then the guy finds a text thread that the husband doesn't know about. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, and I, so I think, like, I tell my wife all the time, like, you can check anything or look at anything or my search history or whatever. Like, I'm an open book, you know, and I think it's so important to have that as a couple. Mm -hmm. That's one of my encouragements, whether it's social media or texting or emails or whatever, you know. And, of course, with your devices all synced up, anything could pop up anywhere, you <laughs> yeah. know. But for us, that's good, yeah. you know. We, we like to be... Uh, we like to know what's going on. We like to be vulnerable, and we have nothing to hide. Amen. Why don't you do the next one, baby, unless there's something you want to add? Oh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do if my spouse has a pornography addiction? Feel free. <laughs> You're up. It's your turn. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, uh, so what's interesting is this started as largely a men's issue, and now it's also become a woman's issue. And so 
a lot of people are struggling with it, you know, categorically. I would say, uh, first and foremost, if you know that your husband has a struggle and a problem, uh, as devastating and difficult as that is, at least you know. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of people, they don't know what's wrong in their marriage, they don't know why their spouse is distant, they don't know why it's not <laughs> working, and they don't know that this is the root problem and issue. So at least you know. And as hard as it is to know, it's better than not knowing. And I would say this is the epidemic of a generation. And what we've done is uh, they found that uh, brain science has discovered uh, that you create neural pathways in your brain toward dopamine and pleasure centers. Right. And one of the shortcuts is pornography, especially for men. Right. And so as we're handing screens to younger and younger men and they're scrolling and watching for longer and longer durations, we're just creating generations of addicts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it really is a crisis and it's a generational problem. And so um, I, think, I think to be fair, we all should give some recommendation for what to do on this so I'm not shouldering the load. But the first thing that I would say is um, I would encourage your spouse. Well, first of all, I would be in a good, healthy, loving, supportive church community that was not religious. Yeah. Right. Uh, religious people want to beat you down. God's people want to build you up. Right. And what you get sometimes in a religious environment is everybody's pretending like they're fine. Yeah. And if you're the one who says you're not, then they align to really yeah. attack you. So you want to be in a, a grace-centered, loving, helpful place yeah. for you and your family. And then you want to really consider who you're going to welcome into that conversation. Right. You don't want to tell a lot of people. You don't want to tag in your family. Right. You don't want to tag in social media. But it's the husband and the wife agreeing, okay, who are, you know, for the wife, who are you going to talk to? For the husband, who are you going to talk to? Right. We keep that as a close circle. We don't involve everyone. And then we we choose trustworthy people that, that we can talk to and pray with and process with and walk the process with. And so church and a handful of healthy people would be where I'd start. What would you add? Can I, get both um, I would say um, Every Man's Battle and the Conquer series are both good recommendations for that. Again, that's oftentimes done in the church, but they also have conferences, but they pair you up with a accountability groups because honestly, with any addiction, you need accountability around you. And if you're wanting to change, that's just what has to happen. And so if it's good, like you said, if you know already that your spouse is struggling with that, um, but the next step is to mutually agree how to get help and then to walk that process together. With any addiction, you don't wanna be alone in it. Um, and you don't wanna be shamed for it. If you're coming clean, you wanna be encouraged to continue to walk in the light and not in the darkness. And so it's gonna be um, a battleground for the enemy, for sure. He's gonna wanna come in and try and divide you in every way. But if you're really wanting to change in this area, there is hope and there is resources, but you need to do it in a healthy community. And do you, would you recommend uh, Counterfeit Climax by Dave and Ashley Willis, our friends? Um, that can help with the underlying issues of intimacy. Um, yeah, for sure. That's a great book. Um, it doesn't necessarily deal, he, he talks about por pornography, but it's not necessarily tackling just that topic, but it deals with the underlying issues of intimacy. I would just add, and this is kind of more of a sobering thing, but I think it's important for men and and in those, especially men with kids, um, you know, uh, I, I think the studies are showing now 80% of kids, seven, even seven years old, have been exposed to pornography. And, you know, there's a reason why the tech overlords don't even have their kids on the apps that they made, yeah. right? So we just, our kids, we don't do social media with our kids. Our kids don't, don't, don't have social media. But I think more importantly, from a spiritual perspective, as a husband, when you cannot get free of that, every time that you uh, succumb to that temptation, you are opening a spiritual door of perversion to your home. I know that sounds really intense, but, but it's true. And you know we're the spiritual head of our home. And so it's your job as a man to close those doors. Yeah. And that spirit doesn't just want to take you out. It wants to take your children out. It wants to get in their dreams. It wants to mess up their, their, their uh, sexual identity. And so that's my encouragement, like feel the urgency to get free from that so that you can do it not just for your sake, but for your whole family. So good. Yeah. Thank you. I, 
I think everything that you guys shared is so good. I think for as a wife, I would just highly encourage you to take um, yourself out of the situation. Obviously, you can walk through your healing with your this, the special people in your life, but it is not because you're not beautiful or you're not pretty enough or you're not good enough or you're not make, meeting needs. It's so much deeper, as you were saying, and what people have done with their brains, and it's, it has nothing to do. So I've seen it actually take out a marriage and take out friends of mine that it has destroyed their 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 sense of self and their security and everything. Um, it is so much deeper. And so it really allows you, I, um, I've walked through this situation with people where I've seen them go, no, you're a child of God and fight for their husbands instead of take it on them. Like you're doing this to me. You've, you know, which it is very hurtful. I'm not saying that. And I think that you should get your own counseling separately as well, but um, to really fight for your marriage, fight for your husband yeah. or your wife, yeah. truly. Yeah. yeah. How about the next one, baby? <laughs> My mother-in-law posted publicly how toxic I am. What a lovely mother-in-law. Is there any recovery from this? Thankfully, you, your mom and I are good. I love your mom. Um, so, I yeah. would suggest a very strong boundary there. Yeah, I, was I just would say. too. But leave and go, cleave, when you, baby. When you, leave and cleave. When you, when you meet a gal, he's like, hey, what's your mom's name? Jezebel. You may be like, I got to rethink my whole date situation. Uh, so she, we'll go to you. You you could take this one. This seems more. I just said leave and cleave, baby. Um, I, you know, I think it's it's it's. It's a very unique um, situation. This is something that I wasn't, I wasn't really, felt like I wasn't really counseled in or, or given a whole lot of, you know, my parents were, they are awesome, but it was like 80s and 90s, baby. Like just, yeah, you'll be awesome. You'll figure it out. Um, high five. <laughs> <get> high five. <laughs> um, but you really are, in, there's a, a sense that you're marrying in, into this family and there's a lot of dynamics at play. Mm -hmm. And it's not always the healthiest at times, and most families aren't. Um, and so I think my encouragement is I think there's a lot of boundaries that need to be drawn. And um, I took Kate to the other coast of America, so that helped a little bit with some boundaries. But <laughs> why don't you share a little bit on that? Well, what do you think, Kate, about anybody that's in the f extended family that starts posting private, personal details about other members of the extended family online. That takes a courageous conversation. Really, it takes, hey, right away, getting on that phone, getting with your family member and just saying, this is not okay. You've yeah. crossed a line. And, and really standing up for your marriage. I know that we've dealt with that getting married at 20 and like having to earn respect from our family is like, we are, like he is my husband and we can't talk. Like I can't have this conversation. And she was the oldest in her family yeah. and kind of like helped the family, you know, and, 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 I, and so we were the first to get married on either side. So there was way more speculation and intensity and criticism but over how we were going to do life. Yeah, never online. That's... Yeah, the online part's messed up. Yeah, that's... But. <laughs> so, Grace, if there is a heart, like I say, a courageous conversation to have, so who should have it depending upon the side of the family? The person that the parent, uh, the child of the parent that's doing, the mother-in-law that's doing that. So, like, so if your mom was doing that about me, you should you, have the conversation yeah, with good. your mom. Yeah. You're setting that. First, I should have the conversation with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but I love my mom and dad. They're great. They would never do this. No. Uh, but before I dialed up my mom, I would dial up my dad. Yeah, agree. say, hey, Ahab, uh, talk to mom. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not, that's not okay. And the fact that she is, you know, speculating, <laughs> speculating this, you know, scenario, the fact that she thinks it's okay and actually is doing it, is mind blowing. Like, talk to each other. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah. You know? Or don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the if you really might... have a problem, <laughs> then try talking to each other or talking to the husband. But yeah, to go and attack because it's really just her opinion and they're married 
And as a mother-in-law, your role is to encourage godliness in the marriage of your kid and grand, you know, in-law. And so for her to do the opposite and cause division is totally ungodly. Yeah. And so for me, like when, you know, when our kids are, I, I want to encourage our son-in-laws and our daughter-in-laws. Yeah. I want them to know that we love them and care about them and and I don't want to overstep, and so I'll ask questions if I, you know, you have the freedom to talk to me. If I've, you know, overstep in a conversation, please tell me, and I'll back away. Um, we are, we try and be way more open and honest about that. Well, so we've we got uh, two daughter-in-laws and a son-in-law, and if we did this, they would rightly cut us oh, off. Oh, they would totally cut us off. And, uh, and, and within that, they would have to to secure health for That's their right. own marriage and family where we wouldn't be giving them any choice. And there's a big difference between secrecy and privacy. Uh, secrecy is we're doing something really bad and we're trying to hide it. Privacy is like, it's just not your business. Mm -hmm. And if there's an interpersonal you know, conflict within an extended family and you post it on the internet, you're like, that is a complete violation of privacy. Mm -hmm. And then what those people do, they, they like to pretend that they're victims. And we live in a victim culture, so like, oh, here's what they said, here's the, what they did. And you find all the bitter people online that have that same sort of dysfunction and brokenness, and then they align together as some sort of counterfeit support group to weaponize the pain and cause evil. And this is how a lot of groups are actually formed and fashioned online. It's broken, hurting people just encouraging the worst in one another. It's a really tragic thing. You can avoid some of this by setting up boundaries before you get married or when you're newly married so that you're ready for those. And you can say, no, we created, we said that we weren't going to allow that. So you're stepping over that line and I'm sorry and we love you, but that's not just, that's not going to be permitted. How about the next one? Will people post about us on the internet? <laughs> um, How do I encourage my husband to be a better leader at home than he is at work? Hmm. I think that um, I actually just saw a comedian post this morning. He's super funny, but he was like, when a dad comes home, he's like the backup quarterback that comes in and he just kind of does his thing and everyone waits for the real guy to come in. And I thought, that's awful. That is just the worst thing that everyone's laughing at this because that couldn't be more wrong. I think that if you're wanting your husband to be a better leader, it's just like making room for him and not micromanaging everything. And if he's not going to do whatever as good as you might think, like just give him the space and let him be a dad. He's supposed to have a different role and a different, um, a different experience for the kids. And I know that when I put my kids to sleep, it's quiet and it's nice and wonderful and we <laughs> they're so cute. And when I'm like, hey, can you put them to bed? It's loud and they're <laughs> wrestling and screaming and some, someone ends up crying and I'm annoyed. But it's beautiful and, <laughs> and probably needed and healthy. And I have to tell myself that when I'm scrubbing the dishes downstairs. But I, I, I do think you just need to leave room to let him be a leader because so many women will yeah. take up we, all the space. Yeah, and, and there's personality differences. And so there's some guys that they're, they're more of a laid back personality and, and, and maybe the, the wife is more high strung or whatever. And will you be a better leader, be a better leader. Well, get out of the way, like give him some room, you know? And I think that that, what you're saying I think is really helpful and I think that that that's that space like let him step into that space and give him give him room and then don't criticize every yes. little thing he does that you know that's different they they, they the boys need to get roughed up a little yeah. bit you know and 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 it's good for them it's like you know it's so just to clarify you're not like assaulting your daughter no 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 sorry yeah yeah this is all like fun and games yeah <laughs> I got three boys, you know, so we, we, we have some competitions before bed, and <laughs> it can get a little crazy. It's always yeah, good to jumping work off the bunk up bed. Yeah. yeah. I think encouragement is huge, too. Like, so often we can want change, and, we, and we'll do that through criticism. So if you want your spouse to step up, like, encourage it. Mm -hmm. Call it out in the best way instead of criticizing. Yeah, men want to be respected, women want to be loved. That's what the Bible 
uh, commands us to do because that's the harder thing to do for each of us. Um, so we have to work at being respectful. And when we respect them, they will rise up and they will lead better. Um, there's a really great book called The Flirtation Experiment. And it talks about how to um, flirt with your spouse again and, and Amen. have fun. Right, Sean? Like have two fun or three witnesses? We, in the relationship yeah. so that then it's not just all working at the relationship. We right. forget sometimes how to ha just have fun and be friends. And so it might just be a matter of just taking yourself more lightly and not like she said, criticizing everything they're doing. Because honestly, they're not going to want to step up and lead if everything they do is getting criticized. No, you got to do it that way. No, that's not right. I mean, that's not really encouraging them to lead. And so, and maybe that's not what you're doing. But maybe there just needs to be more fun in your marriage. Maybe there needs to be just, hey, is there something I'm doing that keeps you or pulls you back from wanting to lead? Ask the honest question. Maybe you need to remember that you like each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's different than love, yeah. you know, which is good. Have dates, have fun. Remember how much you liked each other, not just parental roles. Yeah. Exactly. What I would say for a man, I'd, uh, if you want your husband to go up, you, you can't push him up through nagging, but other men can pull him up through coaching. Yeah. And so a lot of guys, they didn't have a dad or they didn't have right. a good or a present or yeah. an active dad. So they're like, okay, I know that God says I need to be active and present and yeah. a leader of my family, but practically I've never seen that. I don't, I don't know what that looks like. And maybe the woman, she grew up in a different home and so she has a different experience and she has different expectations. The key then is this is where um, men need to be in church. And statistically, if men are in church, and they start to build friendships with other men in church, those men will pull them up. Yeah. The guys that are a little more assertive, they'll pull the passive guys up. The guys that are a little more timid, the courageous guys will pull them up. And so, you know, part of it is just, um, this will sound offensive, but uh, it's helpful. And uh, most churches are built for women and children. They're not built for men, yeah. period. And so what happened after the world wars uh, the men all went to war, and then the churches were just filled with women and children and older men. Yeah. The men came back from war, and the women and children and older men had remade the church. Now the decor and the style and the tone and the music, it all is more effeminate. And women feel more comfortable in a masculine environment if it's not angry and aggressive. Men don't feel comfortable in a feminine right. environment. It's why women will go to a sports bar and men won't go to a nail salon. Or at least they used to not. Um, 2024, though. 2024, though, bro, I know. So then, so then what happened was the men came back and they're like, in the military, we had a brotherhood and we were together. And now we're, we go to church and it's for women and children and older men. So then men stopped going to church and churches stopped being built for men. So then we increase divorce ministry, we increase children's ministry, right. we increase right. student ministry, but it's like, okay, what are we doing for the men to solve the problem, not just be downstream dealing with the consequences? Yeah. And so part of it then is oftentimes it's a woman who's more spiritual and there's 11 to 13 million more women than men in church. So most churches are predominantly female. Well, that means the wife and the mother, she's usually the spiritual one, she picks the church. Right. So, well, this is a good church. I really, I cried during worship and my kids liked it. And dad's like, that's why I'm not going, you know? Um, and so the question then is, are you even inviting your husband into finding a church that doesn't just work for you, but works for him? And that the leaders and the men and the pastor are the kind of men that can pull him up and he can find that brotherhood to help strengthen him. And I think this is the massive gap in our culture because fathers sadly are often absent. And if the church doesn't fill the gap, there's no option. There's no one else seeking to fill the gap. And then you get all this confusion and, yeah. and you get passive men that are sort of rewarded for being spineless. And our culture has no idea what it's doing and it's breaking young men. And as a result, it's devastating the future. And so I would even ask the wives, like, is your husband at least as excited about you to be involved in that church community right. and to be with those dudes? Yeah. Yeah. One thing to add, well, two things to add to that quickly. Um, this couple that we were kind of pouring into and helping in this kind of dynamic, one of the things that changed practically for them, and it seems like a small thing, but it ended up being a big thing, was when the, when the man started, you know, I want him to come up higher, lead more, da-da-da. Well, he's not over 
enough decisions. He's not even over the, the finances. Like, you're the one that manages all that. Yeah, but I'm good at it. Well, let him try it. So she passed all that stuff over, and it changed their whole marriage, wow. right? So even just that practically, like, and, and I know that might seem like a silly thing, but it, it's a big thing. You know, when he started being over everything that was happening financially, their, their marriage changed. Second thing I wanted to add, my life was so profoundly marked as a kid walking into RFK Stadium at Promise Keepers with my father, mm. seeing 60,000 men raising their hands to Jesus. Right? I saw as a kid, that's what a real man looks like. That's the encounter I want to have for my kids and the next generation that's coming up. Because like you're saying, and this is why it's so important what you guys are doing at this church and with Real Face with the men's ministry is so fire here because we need that all across America. We need, we need come on, let's just thank God for that. I'll never forget that image in my mind. And I went to a lot of church services with my mom. Yeah. But that one time with my dad, I mean, I went to, with my dad a lot. He was a pastor. But that moment walking into that stadium, hearing those men worshiping powerful. was powerful. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. We love you. We appreciate you've become a friend of our family and our church and our ministry. And we're very honored, Kate, that you were able to join us. And thank you. It's a blessing to have you. Could you guys thank the voice for joining us? Yeah. All right, we got one more thing and then we're gonna let you go. You guys are up. Sounds good. Well, Ashley has the winner for the raffle and then we're gonna pray over Sean if you guys would do that with us. So Ashley, who won the raffle? Okay, not only is this a great book, it's a great book, buy it if you have not. There's also a gift card in here for a restaurant, not Applebee's, nicer than that. Very nice restaurant. You'll enjoy it. Chili's, you're right. Sean picked the gift card out. Huge step up from Applebee's. Um, okay, cool. The winner is Steve Nelson. Are you here? Steve Nelson's right there. Come on, Steve. Man, you're out punching your weight class on tech, Steve. Thank you. Um, well, one reminder for you guys, no real men or real women this week. Go out on a date like a real man. Uh, do that for sure. And then uh, if you guys can just join us, just raise a hand. We're going to pray over uh, Sean and Kate and the incredible ministry they are, they're doing. Lord, we thank you for this couple, their marriage, their family, their ministry. Lord, we pray against the enemy of servants, their works and the facts. We thank you. Uh, that he's been touring the country, leading prayer and intercession rallies at state capitals for the well-being of our nation. We thank you that he's been one of the strongest voices uh, in the faith community on the life issue. And we thank you, Lord, that as powerful as his ministry is on the stage, it's his marriage and family off the stage that is actually more impressive. And Lord, I thank you that they don't just worship on tour, but they worship at home. And Lord, I thank you for the great wife that he's given, uh, you've given to him. I pray for blessing and encouragement on their marriage and family. I pray for generational legacy of serving the Lord Jesus. And God, as they're headed off to Vegas tomorrow to lead prayer and worship on the strip for the Super Bowl, we pray for protection and provision, and we pray for the presence of God to go before them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us.